welcome to Talk to Internal Audit. And today we are going to be looking at communication and particularly the communication between the Chief Audit Exec, Head of Internal Audit and the Audit Committee. But before we start there, I hope you've all got your cups of coffee, your glass of water or whatever it is that you um, want to drink to relax and engage with us as we go through the next half hour or so. So, first and foremost, for those of you that don't know, please can I introduce myself? I'm Liz Sandwith. I'm the Chief Professional Practice Advisor, we don't go in for short titles, at the Chartered Institute of Internal Auditors, as you will see from the banner behind me. And my responsibility is around technical guidance, uh, production of, talking about, sharing thoughts around. So that's why I'm doing these sessions. The Chartered Institute of Internal Auditors includes the UK and Ireland. So we have 10,000 members across the UK and Ireland, and we are also part of the Global uh, Institute of Internal Auditors that has 200,000 members across 170 countries and across all sectors and um, we all sign up to the same standards and code of ethics. So our International Professional Practices Framework, our IPPF, uh, is the same wherever in the world you are fulfilling your responsibilities as internal auditors if you are professionally qualified. So I wanted to cover that first. Now, perhaps the most exciting bit and new and for the first time, I want us to have a look at the competition that we had last week, if you remember, and who are the winners. So um, we talked last week about glitches um, when you're doing exactly what I'm doing now. Um, and we asked you to share with us some of the more amusing glitches. And we said we'd give a prize. Um, to the one who came up with the funniest glitch in terms of cyber security and remote working. Um, we called it Home blue Bloopers, I think we called it. So two prize winners because we had two really great stories. One, and the first one is Mal Whitmore, whose poor dog, who if you look on his website, is a very beautiful dog, uh, threw up during a Teams meeting he was having. Mal, for your troubles, we gifted you with your very own dog-themed desktop wallpaper. So hope you love that, hope you enjoy it, uh, and I hope all your colleagues enjoy it with you. Then we had a second uh, winner, James um, Meager, who, like uh, Mal, found himself in a slight problem, slight hitch, when he was in the middle of uh, a video calling meeting. Um, the story goes, and I want to read this because I want to make sure I get it right. At the start, at the start of lockdown, James had no space to work in his house, so resorted to working in a caravan in the drive. During a video call in his caravan one day, his roofer, obviously doing some work for him, apparently banged on the side of the van and told him, and I quote, get on with some real work instead of hiding in there asleep. In hearing this, James's wife, assuming him to be in the act of napping, rushed out only to discover he was in the middle of a video call and um, much to his embarrassment. So James, like Mal, we'd like to gift you with your very own customized desktop wallpaper. Hopefully you'll both enjoy it and it will remind you of these sessions, but also make you smile. So this week, if you want to be a, a prize winner, uh, want to win a special prize, um, I'm going to announce the competition late, later. But today I want to talk about the relationship and the communication in what is potentially difficult times between the Chief Audit Exec and the Audit Committee. Now, as a Head of Audit, um, you will communicate on a very regular basis with your head of inter with your chair of your audit committee because remember that's our reporting line, and I would like you all to take away an action from today. If you are in the private sector, the third sector, or the financial services sector, please could I just ask you to have a look at the codes 
that the Institute has put together. The financial services sector code was revised in September 2017 and the um, private sector third sector code we published uh, in on the 9th of January this year. So just have a look at those because it talks about your reporting line, it talks about your relationship with the chair of the audit committee and how important that relationship is. Normal times, i.e. pre-March this year, um, the sort of things that you need to be thinking about when you um, work with the chair of your audit committee. So I want us to focus on, on all of those sorts of things. And, and as I said, have a look for me at the code um, and see what it has to say about reporting lines, particularly with regard to the audit committee. And the important thing in that relationship is that the chair of the audit committee, audit committee itself, is responsible for setting the objectives of the head of internal audit, um, and evaluating their performance. And that responsibility should not be delegated to the chief executive officer or the chief finance officer. Some internal audit functions and therefore the head of internal audit have a reporting line into the CFO rather than uh, into the CEO. But the codes suggest that the appropriate administrative, be careful of that word, reporting line for the head of internal audit is into the CEO or the rather than the CFO. But functional reporting line is into the chair of the audit committee. So what I want to share with you today as we think about all of this is um, what do we mean about communication and how effective is communication? I am a chair of an audit and risk committee in the housing sector, social housing sector. So I, I want to look at this from both sides, if you like. I want to look at it from a head of audit, a CAE who has reported probably for 25 years now into audit committees. And I want to also reflect probably, I think, four years, I would say, that I have been chair of an audit and risk committee and having um, head of internal audit report into me. So I, I want to look at it from both those perspectives. As a head of internal audit reporting into audit committees, I can cast my mind back to um, public sector, private sector, private sector media world. And um, I can give you a, a brilliant example, well, I think it is anyway, of um, the head of audit uh, sitting at the audit committee. Um, in this example, in this organization, uh, all of the audit committees were chaired by a um, shareholder and um, the audit committees were attended by all the other shareholders representatives, usually the CFO, FD, um, and for this particular organization, the CEO always attended, as did the CFO. And in this particular instance, I'm thinking about very strong chair of the audit committee. Um, he didn't uh, waste any time. His view was, you've had the papers, you've read them, and then he would go around the table, external audit, internal audit. So Liz, you have got... Um, five minutes, what are the three key points you want to make? We've all read the papers, so I made my three key points. Then um, he opened the floor up to questions from other shareholders, and um, they were in, allowed to ask questions. And in this particular instance, one of the shareholders asked about um, expenses, personal expenses, and who signed off the personal expenses. There was a very quiet moment and before I had chance to answer our CEO said I sign off every expense claim across the organization it went even quieter you could have heard a pin drop and everybody looked at the floor because reality said that that doesn't happen the CEO would never sign off every single expense claim from a junior member staff who'd been on a tube to go to a meeting. No, 
What he meant was he signed them off for the senior management team, but he wasn't clear. I'm sitting there, heart racing, thinking, oh my goodness, what if somebody asks me if that's correct? I think fortunately everybody realised that there'd been a, a slight exaggeration from the CEO and we moved on very quickly. So I've had those sort of meetings where um, they are very um, nerve wracking, if you like. I've always believed that as a head of internal audit, appearing before an audit committee, you absolutely prepare for your meetings. You think about the report you've submitted. And I always used to share that report with the CEO. This is what I'm saying. I'm sharing it with you as a matter of courtesy. I am not giving you the option to change anything, but I'm sharing it so that you know what it is I am going to say in the meeting. I didn't want them to be embarrassed or backfooted. Um, and I've always found that they were very grateful of, of that opportunity. And then you sit and you think about what am I going to say in terms of what are the questions that are going to be asked in these meetings? And sometimes the questions came from the left field and no amount of thinking, planning, anticipating would have told me that that was a question that somebody was going to ask. Um, but, you, you know, usually you get it right. I, it's always important that the head of internal audit uh, appears professional, appears competent, and actually knows what they're talking about um, so that they can face the challenges from the members of the audit committee. I had a, another example in the public sector where I had been asked by our external auditors, who were the NAO, to do some work around um, the prompt submission of expenses because the NAO had done some audit work in that space and were very concerned that um, expense claims were very late in being submitted, maybe three, four months after the expenses had been incurred. And I did some, some work around that. Basically, it was some fairly basic testing, um, bigger sample than the NAO had taken, and I identified one persistent offender in terms of late submission. But there had been significant improvements since the NAO report. I put my report together. I presented it to the audit committee. Um, and I was asked by the chair of the audit committee who this persistent um, person was. And I said, it's fine. Uh, there's been some communication. We're looking to see how we can address the problem and how important it was to see that there had been significant improvement between the NAO doing their piece of work and the work that I'd done and how we were on a good journey and everybody was improving in terms of what they were doing and some claims were being submitted promptly. And he tapped the table and he said, no, Liz, I need to know exactly who is this person who, this one person who's letting the side down. And I said, no, I, I don't think it's necessary. Um, he didn't read the body language. He didn't get what I was trying to say without saying it. And then he said, no, Liz, I insist. And he pointed his finger at me. You tell me who this individual was. And I said, it's you, Mr. Chair of Audit Committee. You are the one persistent person who fails to submit his expenses promptly. And he went, moving on quickly now. Um, thank you for that, Liz. Uh, I'll address it immediately. So that relationship um, was built at that moment in time in terms of um, openness and honesty and trust. And thereafter, we would speak on a weekly basis. He would pick up the phone. We would chat. Um, the relationship was built on that moment because he knew I tried to save him the embarrassment, but because of his approach, he'd landed himself in it. So that relationship between the head of internal audit and the chair of the audit committee is very, very important. And I would go so far to say at one point in an organization that was going through massive change um, and was about to be purchased by a another organization, we were going through an acquisition moment, 
the chair of the audit committee actually said to me, Liz, I think you need to think about whether you want to stay here. I have concerns about the purchaser of this organization moving forward. And having worked with you for a number of years, I think you need to think about moving on because I think it's going to be a very challenging, very difficult um, relationship because of what I know about this new organization. And I, I heard what he said, supported by uh, advice and guidance from both the CEO and the CFO. Um, and it transpired they were both right when I read the press and the stories later on. So building that strong relationship is really important. I have um, regular conversations um, with heads of audit um, and as an audit committee chair. I also have uh, regular conversations as a head of audit with our um, chair of our audit committees in the various organizations in which we operate or which I operate. I think the one thing I want to draw to attention is thinking about this in the COVID-19 world. One of the things I've been talking about quite consistently um, on behalf of the Institute is the importance in this rapidly changing world, this world where we are unclear what tomorrow might look like. Um, I've just seen um, Benny and Jerry, um, uh, uh, Frankie and Benny, sorry, not Benny and Jerry. I don't know why I had ice cream on my mind. Um, Frankie and Benny are about to make 3,000 people um, redundant. The, the number and the scale of redundancies coming through is really quite alarming, I think. And it's got to touch the world of internal audit. I can't see how it can't. So talking on a regular basis with the chair of your audit committee in terms of what you as internal audit are doing in this organization is got to be one of the most important things that you can do. We did a, a bit of a survey, um, only a very small one, um, at, at the Institute talking to some of our heads of internal audit. And a number of them are still re um, speaking to their audit committee chair only on a quarterly basis. Uh, that causes me some concern because I think we need to be making sure that our audit committee know about the new and emerging risks um, and also um, understanding with our audit committee chairs some of the challenges um, that we as internal audit face and also they face because don't forget, there is also personal accountability in relation to the chair of the audit committee. You know, you will have seen in the press corporate governance failures and people will say, you know, the chair of the audit committee, Liz Sandwith, you know, what did you do? How did you miss this? What did you not ask in terms of either external or internal audit? So personal reputation damage can be quite significant. So in these changing times, we need to make sure that we talk a lot to our audit committee chair and our members and tell them about some of the things that we are doing. So something else I'm identifying, and I know I haven't told you about the competition yet, I'm coming to that, but some of the things that I'm also identifying is some uh, audit committees wanting to postpone meetings because they don't want to conduct them in a virtual world. From a governance perspective, that, that is also concerning. I've done a board meeting now and an audit committee in the virtual world, and it absolutely works. Okay, it's a bit more difficult to read the room, if you like, to read the body language, but it is still worth doing. And from a governance perspective, you know, if your audit committee is suggesting postponing, I think as heads of audit, we need to be saying no. There is no need to do that. We can have an effective and efficient meeting via a virtual platform. And we can use whatever virtual platforms you use, um, Teams, um, uh, Zoom, um, Life Size is one, and then Google Hangouts. They are, the list of them is growing. Whatever works for your organization, we need to encourage our governance committees to continue to meet. 
I, I am concerned. Um, one of the heads of audit said to me, well, actually, what they said is that the functions of the audit committee will be picked up by the board. I'm not comfortable with that. We need some good separation of duties between audit committee and board. One of the things that we always say, and you'll find documented, is that the chair of the board should not be a member of the audit committee because you want that segregation of duties. Um, so we need to make sure that we are not compromising governance within our organisations. One of the other things um, I, I wanted to share with you, and I've shared a couple of examples, is that um, sometimes it's about finding common ground. So um, winding the clock back a number of years, I won't say how many, uh, a number of years, I had um, some real challenges w with a, an audit committee chair. Um, he didn't have a lot of time for me. He was a very busy man. Um, and I'm not saying it a man as in a, a gender issue. I'm just saying he was very busy um, and he didn't ever have time. Anyway, I, I managed to catch him. He'd come into the organization to meet with the CEO and I, and I saw him leaving and I explained to him why it was really important that we needed to talk. Um, and um, he said um, to the CEO, can we borrow your office for a bit, a moment? And in the CEO's office was um, a bookcase with some model cars in. So I, um, I turned to the, the chair of the audit committee and I said, oh, the CEO must have a, an interest in model cars. Um, I think they were actually not model cars, more Eddie Stobart lorries. And he said to me, um, yes, he said, um, Eddie Stobart, you know, they have a website. So I said, yes, for, for their products. And he said, no, 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 no. He said, um, there is a, a, a culture or a group of people who identify when uh, Eddie Stobart lorries are about, because apparently each lorry has a girl's name attached to it. And he said, we, and I said, oh, I said, you support this? He said, oh, yes. He said, we record and email each other when we've seen a, one of the lorries and where we saw it and at what time. And as I was going home that night, I saw um, a lorry and I think it was Victoria. So I emailed them and I said, I saw Victoria, I, it, this, the chair of the audit committee, I said, I saw Victoria on the M1 at 18.04 um, this particular day. That man has now plenty of time for me and I still speak to him on a regular basis even though I have nothing to do with him anymore or his organizations uh, because he thought I had similar ground so it's about trying to identify opportunities to share and communicate so one of the things I want us to do today or one of the things I'd like you to do is to give some examples to me um, of um, Exa you know, issues you've had around communication and how you've resolved them. And we'll, for the best, we will give a, a prize. So there's some fun here. There's some opportunities here. I don't want it to sound as though um, it's not important. The relationship between the head of internal audit and the chair of the audit committee is particularly important and probably more so now than ever before. Sharing challenges. Have you spoken to your audit committee or did you speak to your audit committee chair before internal audit function was furloughed? Have you challenged your audit committee in terms of the new and emerging risks? Perhaps your audit committee, the chair and the members are asking you still to build, continue with the plan that was agreed in February this year and not reflecting the changes that have occurred. So I want you to factor all of these things in in your head in terms of why it is so important that you talk regularly. And I would go as far as to say a weekly call with your chair of your audit committee on the clear understanding that if I need more time, I will call you, I will email you, whatever the, the method of communication, because you need to make sure that we factor those things into our thinking. They need the audit committee need the support of internal audit, but equally internal audit needs the support of your audit committee. So let's build on that as we go through to make sure that we are all thinking about um, this as we um, continue to evolve into our new world. 
So one of the things that um, I've been advocating is that as the head of internal audit, one of the sort of things that we need to be doing now is preparing a paper for the audit committee that says, this is what we did during lockdown. These are the challenges we faced in remote working. These are the audits that we have undertaken during the lockdown period and particularly what areas they focused on. So maybe we've looked at crisis management, operational resilience, um, new and emerging risks coming down, things like cash reduction, budgeting. Perhaps those are some of the areas where we have focused some of our attention. Explain to the audit committee why and also start building your plan for Q2. I think it is going to be really challenging for us as internal audit to look much beyond the next quarter. The amount of uncertainty, um, I was talking to someone yesterday and they were saying to me that already the NHS is preparing for the second spike in COVID-19. And I'm sort of assuming that will be, I have no knowledge, but I'm assuming that will be perhaps as we move into the autumn. Um, so we could find ourselves in regional lockdown. Um, I think, and I have no, nothing other than what I've read in press, what I've heard on webinars, briefings, etc. cetera. Um, I th th there seems to be a message that says another full lockdown is less likely because of the impact on the economy. And also everyone is saying that, you know, 2021, we're going to be in a, in a recession deeper and potentially more far reaching than anything we've experienced before. So as internal audit, we need to be alerting our audit committee, our audit committee chair to these factors as we move through. Anyway, enough of that. So remember the competition is about a brilliant example of where you've had a communication challenge with your audit committee or indeed maybe other senior management and how you specifically dealt with that. And that could be, you know, just letting them understand what your role was as internal audit, something funny like the Eddie Stobart scenario or something where you have protected maybe a senior manager from being embarrassed by something that you as internal auditor identified. So let's keep the, the remit of this bit of competition as open as possible, um, but let's have some really good examples. Um, and then that will challenge Anton, um, who independently picks a really good example and awards the prize. So let's think about that. So can I do my usual closing things? Thank you ever so much for joining us today. Hope you found the session interesting and helpful, informative. Um, please can I remind you of the COVID-19 hub on the um, Institute's website. The material there, the notes of the meetings are all free and all available both to members and non-members because it's about the profession at this point in time. Can I remind you that this stream is available post the event on the Institute's um, Facebook site. Also follow the Institute on Twitter and Facebook and on LinkedIn for some of the really interesting things that we do, some of the exciting events coming down the track. Um, and also, can I ask you if you are a head of internal audit, you should have received a, a COVID-19 survey please could I ask you to complete that. It shouldn't take you longer than five minutes, but it is really important. Can I also say I'm more than happy to take questions and I do get questions and it's great for me to see what you're thinking about and what the challenges are, because that can flag up to me. We need some technical guidance in this space. We need a webinar, whatever, or maybe it will provide me with a topic for one of these sessions. So please feel free. My email, if you don't know it, is liz, L-I-Z, dot sandwith at iia.org.uk. Um, next week, we are going to talk about some of the lessons we've learned in relation to the risks around COVID-19. I'll also be announcing again the winners of today's competition. Don't forget your coffee. And please, please remember, Talk to the to talk to internal audit because the institute is listening, and I really, really mean that. 
So please share all of the challenges, all of the experiences you are facing, because this is about the internal audit profession working together for the good of our organisations and our profession. Thank you very much. Keep safe and enjoy the weekend ahead. Kind regards. Thank you.